uh, just so we don't forget. Yeah, perfect. And we'll do the same. And I'll perfect. mute. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Sam Fikri. I'm one of the family physician based in Waterloo, and I'll be your host, your host tonight. Before we start, we had several requests from colleagues to record the event tonight. So just before recording, we need the consent of everybody. So just if anybody wouldn't feel comfortable in the conversation part or question answer and doesn't want to record the meeting, just to unmute themselves and let us know or send us a one line message in the chat box that they, they don't want to record the event. If not, we will wait a few seconds and then we can start recording for our colleagues that are not able to attend tonight. And uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, joining us tonight for that exciting meeting. And I would like to extend our thanks for Graham from HLS for sponsoring the event tonight. And I believe I don't see any uh, anybody objecting the recording. So I believe we can start recording. So our speaker tonight is Dr. Pandy, who's an assistant clinical professor adjunct in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University. He's presently a staff cardiologist at Cambridge Memorial Hospital. He's also an interventional cardiologist at St. Mary Hospital in Kitchener. He practiced in, the Cambridge, uh, in Cambridge uh, at the Cambridge Cardiac Care Center. He grew up in Cape uh, Brenton in Nova Scotia, and he went on to complete his BSc at Dalhousie University and his MD at the University of Toronto. He currently has appointments with the Department of Medicine at McMaster University, as well as the Ontario Drug Benefit, uh, ODB Formulary, the Waterloo Wellington Regional Cardiac Care Committee, and the University of Waterloo and Clinical Research Essex Board. He's also a board member of the Kitchener Waterloo Symphony. Dr. Pandy is the founder of the Prevent Clinic, which is a multidisciplinary high-risk prevention clinic focused on risk modification and lifestyle optimization. Including, included among his numerous awards and scholarships in the, is the Rhodes Fellowship for Young Investigators with the Interventional, sorry, International Society of Heart Research. And since 1987, he has authored over 40 peer uh, reviewed publication and abstracts in areas such as heart failure, cholesterol, uh, valvular heart disease, organic mercury toxicity, toxicity, and so on. Dr. Pandy is editor of a daily online newsletter, the Cambridge Heart Health Daily. Outside of spending any free time with his family, he enjoys traveling, a variety of musical and visual arts and volunteer work. He, as his family, started a charity in 2013, child to childca and work each summer for one month at Mother Teresa Orphanage in Panta in India. So without further ado, I will uh, leave the stage for Dr. Pandy, who will be discussing tonight the new 2021 Canadian uh, dyslipidemia guidelines and the role of the novel therapy for vascular risk uh, reduction. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fikri. Can, can everyone hear me okay? I believe so, I can. Perfect, okay. if you can hear me just fine. I was having a bit of technical difficulty a few minutes ago, so just confirming. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fikri, for those kind words. Um, I know, I think almost everybody quite well, so uh, it, I'm humbled to be uh, able to speak to you about this. Um, just two very minor corrections to my intro, which was very kind of you to do. I'm an invasive cardiologist, not interventional, meaning I do angiograms, but I don't do uh, stents and uh, PCI. Uh, and the other thing is with our, Charity, unfortunately, the last year and a half, we have not been able to go back to uh, the orphanage uh, because of uh, the COVID uh, isolations. But we're hoping uh, as things start to improve that perhaps uh, we may be able to, to go back and work with them. We're still continuing to uh, raise funds. And certainly we all recognize right now the, the tragedy that the whole world is facing, but particularly the South Asian subcontinent in India and Nepal just the devastation that's happening to uh, that part of the world um, with COVID. And um, I was actually just on a, a 
call um, the other day with uh, some of the people that that work at some of these charities and you know the the devastation is unbelievable so certainly our thoughts prayers and all our best wishes for this pandemic to end for all of us but particularly in some of these areas that are so hard hit um, that uh, whatever we all can do to help each other and help those in need I know we all are, are trying to do our best during this time um, so thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about the, uh, the, the new lipid guidelines. Um, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society lipid guidelines just came out uh, uh, not that long ago, about a month and a half ago. Um, they're very interesting. There's a, a significant change in the approach to it. So I think it's a good opportunity to discuss both the change that's happened and why it's happened and, and how to think about that. Um, uh, Graham, if you can do maybe the admissions part, because it keeps popping up on my screen to let people in, that would be great. Um, so to, to begin with, uh, I'm going to talk to you about as soon as my uh, computer starts up. Um, these are my disclosures uh, for the presentation. Uh, I think the most important one is that a number of the investigation, uh, the, a number of the trials that we'll be talking about, I was fortunate to be a principal investigator on. And so that does uh, obviously provide uh, some insight, but also bias. So I do need you to be aware of that. Um, our agenda today will be to really to review the 2021 uh, lipid guidelines and what both the changes are and how um, those changes we should be thinking about implementing. The focus is obviously on vascular risk assessment and optimization, uh, incorporating some of these uh, new therapeutics that have become available to us to achieve the best outcomes in our patients. Um, so the guidelines, as I said, just came out in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology. This is the preprint proof. It's on uh, line now. Um, and, you know, there is a significant change in approach, which we'll discuss as we go through. But first of all, what's not new in the guidelines? Well, first of all, statin therapy continues to be the mainstay, and it is recommended for all individuals, certainly with clinical atherosclerosis, if they have coronary artery disease, if they have cerebral vascular disease, carotid disease, if they have peripheral vascular disease, uh, you know, previous FEMPOP bypasses, also patients with abdominal aortic aneurysms, all of them should be on statin therapy. Those with diabetes, certainly for any extended length of time beyond 10 years, or those above the age of 40, or with multiple coronary risk factors, diabetics should be on statin therapy. And we've also recognized for the last two guidelines that chronic kidney disease patients are at a significant increased risk of atherosclerotic events. So CKD patients, it is recommended that they be on statin therapy to help reduce that event rate. And so none of this is new. This is all things that we know that we all try to implement day to day in our practice. Um, in primary prevention, uh, we have stated that those with very high LDLs above the level of five where their lifetime exposure to cholesterol will be very high, they should be started on uh, lipid lowering therapy early uh, once that uh, very high level of LDL has been identified. In those that fall into a lower intermediate risk category, there are other risk identifiers that, that uh, we all have gotten comfortable with. The Framingham Risk Score, which you know, we use a modified version of that in Canada, where we give uh, extra preference to those with underlying family history of uh, atherosclerotic disease. We double the Framingham Risk. Similarly, we recognize that certain ethnic populations are at a significantly higher risk. Those from the native Canadian population um, are at a significantly higher risk, and we double their Framingham risk score. Those of South Asian descent from the Indian subcontinent uh, are, at, again, at a significantly higher risk than others. And again, we double uh, their Framingham risk when we do the calculation uh, in the Canadian model. So none of this is new. These are all things that, that I think all of us have known about and have uh, tried to implement in our practices. What is new? Well, one of the things that is new is that we are recommending that all individuals have a lipoprotein A measurement at least once in their lifetime as an initial part of lipid screening to assess their cardiovascular risk. So what does that mean? Lipoprotein A is an independent risk for atherosclerotic disease. It, it does not work through the same ApoB LDL pathway. It is an independent genetically derived atherogenic molecule um, that is inherited within families. It is purely genetically derived. It does not come from any dietary sources and is not readily manipulatable. 
no dietary or exercise or lifestyle intervention changes lipoprotein A. Uh, and traditional therapies, uh, including statins, do not lower lipoprotein A. PCSK9 inhibitors do lower it to about 20 to 30 percent. And there are now trials ongoing with direct lipoprotein A lowering antibodies to see will it actually make a difference in atherosclerotic events. It's not clear whether lipoprotein A reduction with either uh, uh, PCSK9 inhibitors or direct lipoprotein A lowering antibodies will actually reduce atherosclerotic events. What we do know though is that those individuals that have an elevated lipoprotein A are at a significantly higher risk of future atherosclerotic events. So we help, we use that primarily to identify individuals that are at a greater uh, than usual risk for atherosclerotic events and mo you know, modify their risk, I guess, aggressively as possible. While we can't say definitively lowering lipoprotein A will reduce their risk, we know that even in that population, lowering their LDL will lower their risk. So we do more aggressively treat patients with lipoprotein A to much lower LDL targets and start their treatment earlier because again, lipoprotein A is a genetically derived cholesterol. So it is something they would have been exposed to uh, all their life and it will be a, an atherogenic uh, propensity all of their life. So we wanna start treating them early with risk reduction strategies. Similarly, we are now, uh, for the first time in the guidelines, recommending coronary uh, uh, artery calcium scoring in those individuals where we're trying to decide, is it time to initiate statin therapy? If we're on the fence on that, um, if their risk profile falls into an intermediate risk category and we're not sure whether we should sta start statin therapy or not, course, coronary artery calcium scoring may help to tip the balance. If their coronary artery calcium score is above 400, the, we recommend initiating uh, lipid reduction therapy. In those that have very low cor coronary artery calcium scores below 100, perhaps we can hold off on it. So it does help in clinical decision making. Having said that, if you've already decided that they need statin therapy, either they have an atherosclerotic event, you know that they have atherosclerosis from other imaging, like they have an abdominal or aneurysm or peripheral vascular disease, or they're diabetic, or you've already decided that they need statin therapy, there's no point in doing coronary artery calcium scoring. It doesn't make a difference in that point. The whole purpose of coronary artery calcium scoring is to really decide in the intermediate risk category, is it worth initiating therapy with statins at this point or can we defer for the time being? So that's really the purpose. It's the first time we've now recommended CAC scoring in the Canadian guidelines. The Americans have been doing that for some time. At times they were a little bit ahead of the curve. I think the data now supports that in that intermediate risk category. We've also now recommended more aggressive preventive care for women who develop hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Uh, what we know is that patient and women that have preeclampsia or eclampsia um, have a much greater lifetime risk of atherosclerotic events, the risk of MIs are significantly higher, the risk of heart failure and renal dysfunction is significantly higher. It is a vascular disorder. So again, you know, women that have a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, particularly if they have more than one episode of preeclampsia, they're at a much greater risk over their lifetime of atherosclerotic cardiovascular events. So we want to be much more aggressive in that patient population, um, be screening their lipids much earlier, and considering lifestyle interventions pretty much right off the bat, and earlier initiation of pharmacological therapy if they meet treatment guidelines. So being much more aggressive in this patient population. So the purpose is really to identify individuals that are at a greater risk that need earlier and more aggressive therapy. Uh, beyond okay, that can though- Can I interrupt for a second? Yes, of course, of course, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, I forgot to, to ask. Can I interrupt you and ask you a few questions that appear any, on the chat? At, at any point, please okay. interrupt as we're going along and I'm happy to field questions as we go along, uh, Sammy. Thank you. So the first question would be lipoprotein A, is it covered by ODB or not? And how much would it cost if private? Yeah, yeah it, it unfortunately is not covered. Ontario is, I think, the last remaining province where lipoprotein A is not covered. I think the cost is around $25. Um, and you only measure it once. Um, once you know what their lipoprotein A is, it does not change with time. And we don't really have any pharmacology that changes it either. But unfortunately, at least right now, it's not covered by, by OHIP. Okay, thank you. Not a worry. Um, so the, the other main um, 
change that's happened with the lipid guidelines is the idea of thresholds for lipid lowering therapy. Rather than targets, we're now talking about thresholds for intensifying lipid lowering therapy with non-statin agents. So what does that mean? Once you've decided that someone is uh, warrants statin therapy, there will be those that despite statin therapy will still remain at greater risk for atherosclerotic events. And we need to try to identify those people and get more aggressive about their therapy, consider adding in non-statin agents that have been proven to reduce uh, cardiovascular events. And we'll talk about that for much of the remainder of the talk. But the goal is to identify those that will derive the greatest benefit from intensification of therapy. Not everybody needs to be on everything. It is really about personalized medicine, trying to identify those that remain at increased atherosclerotic event uh, risk and uh, provide the most appropriate therapy for that individual. Um, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about this concept of thresholds, which is, I think, one of the major changes. So that really applies to those where where you have already decided that they need statin therapy. So remember, that's all individuals that have an LDL above five, even if their Framingham risk score uh, calculates low. Um, those individuals that are diabetic and have other risk factors or above the age of 40, individuals with chronic kidney disease, or those with established atherosclerotic disease, either coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, or cerebrovascular disease, or those with abdominal aortic aneurysms. All of these individuals should be considered early for statin therapy. Once we get them on statin therapy, we recheck their lipids anywhere between three to six months after initiation of statin therapy and appropriate lifestyle guidance. Once that's the case, we now need to identify those that still remain at a residual increased risk despite optimum statin therapy, who requires further therapy. And so the guidelines now address that in a more robust manner. And so they've come up with this concept of thresholds. Our threshold is now an LDL above 1.8. If someone has established atherosclerotic disease and is on maximum tolerated statin therapy, if their LDL is above 1.8 or an ApoB above 0 0.7 or an HDL non-HDL cholesterol above 2.4, we need to intensify LDL lowering therapies. In those that have a modest elevation of LDL above 1.8, so between 1.8 and 2.2, azidamide or isotrol might be enough in that population. But those that have a significantly higher LDL above 2.2, we will not get to very low levels of LDL that we now require with azidamide alone and PCSK9 inhibitors should be considered first and azidamide second as add-on. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in, in a few minutes. The other major changes now we have added in the guidelines, the addition of icosapentyl ethyl or Vasipa is the brand name. This is a very purified a uh, form of omega supplementation that is the first uh, triglyceride lowering therapy that has now been shown definitively to lower atherosclerotic events and cardiovascular mortality. And because that's such a novel development, I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about that as we go through the rest of this presentation. But let's first talk about the other two parts, the lowering of LDL below 1.8. So remember, that's now the three new threshold. If you're on statin therapy and if you have atherosclerotic disease, your LDL is above 1.8 still, we need to intensify statin, uh, we need to intensify therapy. If their LDL is only modestly elevated, azidamide may be adequate, and that data comes from the Improve It study that I was fortunately a part of. This was a trial of azidamide on top of statin therapy, and we saw that azidamide had a modest effect on atherosclerotic events. It took about seven years of azidamide therapy before we saw any major benefits, and the absolute benefit was about a 2% a reduction. So it is a minimal impact of this therapy, um, but in those that have a modest further elevation of LDL between 1.8 to 2.2, our guidelines now suggest that azidamide be added as a second therapy if they're in that marginal LDL elevation. So still above the threshold of 1.8, but not dramatically above that, azidamide may be adequate. In those that have a significant elevation of LDL, 
well above 2.2 despite maximum statin therapy. We know that azidomide just will not get the job done. And now, fortunately, for the last few years, we've had PCSK9 inhibitors that have shown a robust reduction of LDL beyond statins alone. We have two uh, PCSK9 inhibitors available to us in Ontario, alirucumab or praluent or evolucumab or rapatha, and both show a robust anywhere between 55 up to 75% reduction of LDL after they've already been on statin therapy. So statins may lower that LDL 30 to 40%, and the PCSK9 inhibitors will further lower LDL anywhere between 55 up to 75% on different populations. So a robust further reduction, and certainly much more than what we would achieve with azidomide alone. And we know now from various trials that this robust reduction does further reduce cardiovascular events. This is a, a slide from the Fourier trial, which again, I was fortunate to be involved in. This randomized patients already on maximum statin therapy who had established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease to rapatha or avalucumab versus placebo plus background statin therapy. So the addition of avalucumab on top of statin therapy further reduced the risk of cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke by an absolute risk reduction of 2% within 36 months. And that was about a 25% risk reduction on top of maximum statin therapy. So based on this, as well as the Odyssey Outcome Trial, which looked at alirucumab or praluent, again showing the other PCSK9 inhibitors showing a robust reduction in cardiovascular events, the new guidelines incorporate that into our recommendations, both for those with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, as well as those with familial hyperlipidemia. We know that those that are heterozygous or homozygous familial hyperlipidemia, they will have a lifetime high risk uh, of atherosclerotic disease because they're exposed to high levels of LDL throughout their life. And so we want to get these patients aggressively to low LDL targets very early. Um, and PCSK9 inhibitors have now been shown to reduce LDL robustly in this population and potentially reduce atherosclerotic events in a patient population that has a high burden of ASCVD. Those that have established AC ASCVD, MI patients, peripheral vascular disease patients, those with carotid disease, those with abdominal aortic aneurysms, if they're on maximum statin therapy and their LDL is above 2.2, we know that azidomide alone may not get their LDL low enough. And there, the CCS guidelines are suggesting that we add in a PCSK9 inhibitor on top of maximum statin therapy. We don't stop them at statin, we add in the PCSK9 inhibitor on top of that. And the big major change, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Sam. Back to the lipoprotein A. Yes, if it's of course. Elevated but the patient has no other statin indication, what would be the target LDL? Yes, so excellent question. So once you decide to, to treat someone with statin therapy, the, the LDL targets, again, are the same. The decision is then to decide to start with statin therapy. You want their LDL as low as possible. In primary prevention, we're targeting an LDL below two. Those with established atherosclerotic disease, we're targeting a threshold for intensification above 1.8. So if their LDL is above 1.8, the statin won't be enough and you add in additional therapy. So that same guidance still applies to those that have increased atherosclerotic risk from uh, lipoprotein A elevations alone. So we're still targeting that LDL between uh, 1.8 to 2. Um, so certainly PCSK9 inhibitors are now a robust addition to our therapy. But beyond that, the other major change that we've made to the guidelines come from the REDUCE IT trial. This was a very important trial that came out uh, now, I think about almost two years ago, 18 months ago. Um, this was the first trial that actually showed that triglyceride lowering therapy with a very purified form of omega uh, icosapentyl ethyl or Vasipa is the brand name, significantly and dramatically reduced uh, MACE, three-point MACE of major adverse events, MI, stroke, or cardiovascular death, anywhere between 20 to 31 percent on top of maximum statin therapy. And so based on this, the Canadian guidelines have now adopted that in those individuals that have established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or are diabetic with a cardiovascular risk factor beyond diabetes who have an elevated triglyceride above 1.5. And that was the threshold in the reducer trial where we added in uh, Vasipa or a cospentaethyl. If their triglycerides are above 1.5, 
the addition of icosapentyl ethyl will significantly reduce the risk of adverse atherosclerotic cardiovascular events beyond statin therapy alone. And so this is now a strong recommendation, and it is specifically for those that are at an increased risk of cardiovascular events. They're already on background statin therapy, uh, but their triglycerides are above 1.5. There, the addition of uh, icosapentyl ethyl will further reduce the risk of cardiovascular events. This does not apply to other forms of omega supplementation. Trial data with other forms of omega supplementation have completely failed to show any event reduction. The only omega supplementation that's shown cardiovascular risk reduction is a cosapental ethyl. Um, we also do not recommend other uh, triglyceride modifying therapies like niacin, nor fibrates. The niacin trial, which again, I was a, a part of called, uh, in a, I think it was called Raise It, um, completely failed to show any benefits from niacin, even though it did lower triglycerides. Similarly, the uh, fibrate trials have completely failed to show any cardi cardiovascular protection by the addition of phenofibrate or bisfibrate. Any of the fibrates have really failed to show additional benefits beyond statin therapy. So we do not recommend niacin nor fibrates, but I call Pental ethyl is the first add-on therapy beyond statins you know, to lower triglycerides that do further reduce events. So these are the adjunct therapies that have been shown to significantly reduce cardiovascular events. From the IMPROVE-IT trial, the addition of azitamide has a modest effect. From the Odyssey Outcome and Fourier trial, PCSK9 inhibitors, um, both alirucumab and avalucumab have both shown a significant reduction in cardiovascular events. And from the REDUCE-IT trial, the addition of icosapental ethyl has shown a dramatic further reduction in cardiovascular vascular events beyond statin therapy alone. So I want to spend a little bit of time then talking about the triglyceride lowering effects and its vascular risk, because that is a novel addition to our new guidelines and a focus of uh, a lot of the work that we're now trying to do. We've actually known for some time that triglyceride-rich lipoprotein A's like APOC3 are a significant risk for cardiovascular disease. They're not bystanders like HDL or APOA1 is. They actually contribute to cardiovascular disease. Um, we know that statin therapy alone or statins with azitamide alone <clears throat> are not enough to eliminate the risk or uh, reduce the risk as required to, to prevent atherosclerotic cardiovascular events. So we've really been looking to see what can we do with triglycerides to further lower that event. You know, from studies like the Copenhagen City Heart Study, we've known that patients that have elevated triglycerides are at a greater risk for myocardial infarctions, ischemic heart disease in general, all cause mortality, as well as ischemic stroke. So certainly the causal link to elevated triglycerides has been known for a very long time. It's also known from Canadian data from the CanHeart study from Ontario, again, showing a significant increased risk of cardiovascular events in Canadians that have elevated triglycerides. So the data really applies robustly to this patients, to all of our patients that elevated TG does raise risk. The problem has been that while we've known that triglyceride is a marker of risk, Risk, and there's strong biological, clinical, and genetic evidence to suggest that elevated triglycerides increase cardiovascular risk. Traditional therapies like fibrates, niacin, and omega fatty acid supplements have completely failed to reduce cardiovascular events. And so it's really been just recently that we've now shown in the REDUCE IT trial that icosapental ethyl, which is a very purified form of EPA alone, it does not have any DHA in it, it's pure EPA, that has actually shown a robust reduction in cardiovascular events. So finally, we have data now with a triglyceride lowering therapy that can further reduce cardiovascular event. So let's talk a little bit about what icosapental ethyl is because it is a very unique molecule. It is not a fish oil supplement. It's not you know, over-the-counter fish oils that people are taking nor omega supplements that people are taking. This is a very purified new chemical entity where we've taken the EPA molecule, purified it so the that the capsule contains only 100% EPA. It's been modified chemically to make it more stable so it does not denature and does not oxidize as easily. It's encapsulated, which prevents oxidation, and it's, it improves its absorption. So it is a very unique chemical entity and not a garden variety omega or fish oil supplement. Um, as compared to common fish oil supplements, icosapental ethyl or vasipa is 100% IPE, whereas common fish oils are anywhere between 9 to 10% DHA, about 35 to 40% 
percent saturated fats, 34 percent other types of fats, and only about 20 percent EPA. So a very low content of EPA. And it appears to be EPA or IPA, a cost pentaethyl, which is a purified form and modified form of EPA, and that that EPA, IPA is the, the one entity that can significantly lower triglycerides, but also significantly reduce cardiovascular events. And there have been a number of trials, both with fish oil supplements and omega supplements that have all failed to show benefits, including very large trials like strength and ascend and vital that completely failed to show any benefits from traditional omega supplements. The corollary though, pure EPA supplementation through the JELUS trial, the CHERRY trial, and more recently through REDUCE IT and EVAPORATE that I'll talk to you about now, have shown a robust reduction in cardiovascular events with pure EPA, IPA uh, derivatives. So the guidelines really suggest that we avoid the use of omega supplements that people are using as natural health products, at least for cardiovascular event reduction. There's no data to support that. Very large trials like Ascend and Vital fail to show in as much as 130,000 randomized patients any cardiovascular benefits from supplementation with uh, omega-3 supplements that are available over the counter from naturopathic sources. Um, so the, the natural supplementation with omega supplements has been taken off any guidelines and is not recommended. Uh, we do not recommend the supplements uh, that, that are available over the counter. However, EPA by itself has been shown in now a number of trials to reduce significantly cardiovascular events. This was first shown in the JELUS trial, which was a Japanese trial of almost 19,000 patients where they were supplemented with a pure EPA formulation versus placebo and monitored with time. And there was significant reduction in both the uh, primary and secondary population for cardiovascular event reduction. That led to a large international trial, the Reduce It trial, which was run out of Brigham and Women's in, in Boston. Um, about 8,000 patients were randomized on top of maximum statin therapy to IPA or Vesipa versus placebo. And very hard endpoints were looked at. The five and three point, and, uh, three point MACE endpoints were looked at. Um, uh, very high enrollment rate and very high Completion rate, 99.9% .9 of patients remained adherent to therapy and were followed up at the end. The patients that we studied in this were patients that were already on background statin therapy, but had elevated triglycerides just above 1.5. They were either those with established cardiovascular disease, MIs, peripheral vascular disease, or, or cerebral vascular disease, or diabetics with an additional cardiac risk factors. And then we followed them with time. The triglycerides were modestly elevated on average around 2.4. LDL was quite well controlled at 1.9. Um, and then we randomized these patients and we saw a robust 25% reduction in the five point mace of coronary revascularization, unstable angina, cardiovascular death, um, sub substantially from 28% down to 23%, a 5% absolute risk reduction, and a 25% relative risk reduction. The curves separate very quickly within a year and continue to separate with time. The longer patients are on it, and the p-value has a lot of zeros in front of it, giving us a high confidence that we are making a substantial benefit from this. The harder three-point mace of cardiovascular death, stroke or MI, was again substantially reduced, a 4% absolute risk reduction from 20% down to 16%, and a relative risk reduction of 25%. You need to treat 28 patients with uh, Vesipa in this patient population to have a significant event reduction, again, a p-value with lots of zeros in front of it. When you look at any of the individual endpoints of atherosclerotic events, all of them were significantly reduced by the addition of a cosipental ethyl on top of maximum statin therapy. So every cardiovascular event was significantly reduced. Interestingly, actually, the benefits uh, were accrued in those that both significantly lowered their triglycerides, as well as those that only had a modest reduction in triglycerides. So the benefits with icosapental ethyl may not be all just from its triglyceride lowering properties. There may be other benefits that we're still trying to understand. How exactly is it that this purified form of EPA so significantly reduced cardiovascular events? Every you know, therapy has its uh, positives and its negatives, and there's obviously 
obviously side effects to anything. Uh, IPA, uh, IPE, acosapental ethyl, was in these trials shown to have a minimal increase in the risk of bleeding, primarily in those that were on anticoagulation or dual antiplatelet therapy. We do have to be cautious in patients that are, are particularly on triple therapy if they're on anticoagulants for AFib and on dual antiplatelet therapy after PCI. We have to be cautious about their risk of bleeding with, with any type of omega supplements and IPE included in that. Um, and there was a minimal trend towards increased atrial fibrillation in this population. Again, a modest risk. The benefits were quite substantial with a minimal downside. Those were the only two side effects that were above placebo level. So, you know, when we look at the benefits, we saw a robust reduction in all of the major cardiovascular events with the addition of icosapental ethyl on top of maximum therapy with statins and the number needed to treat was only 21 and to have one major event reduction. In those that had diabetes, we again saw a significant reduction in cardiovascular events, uh, an absolute risk reduction of 7% with a relative risk reduction of about 25% of a major adverse event and hard endpoints again substantially reduced from 51 down to 39%. Um, and it did not matter in the diabetic uh, sub-study whether the diabetics had established cardiovascular disease or not. Diabetics that were primary prevention diabetics that had risk for developing atherosclerotic disease, had slightly elevated triglycerides, still significantly benefited from the addition of icosapental ethyl on top of maximum statin therapy. We also looked at those that you know, needed potential risk for revascularization. And again, we saw that the addition of icosapental ethyl on top of statin therapy significantly reduced the need for future revascularization, both PCI and bypass surgery. Uh, the time to needing those surgeries or interventions was significantly reduced. The need for PCI reduced from almost 14% down to under 10% and the need for bypass surgery from 4% down to 2.4%. So significant reduction in the need for revascularization when acosapental ethyl was added. We looked at those that had established renal dysfunction and benefits were seen across the spectrum of patients with renal dysfunction or uh, intact renal function. So the benefits continue to accrue across the full renal spectrum. So, you know, the, the, the benefits of this were dramatic and substantial and really flew in the face of all, every other triglyceride lowering therapy that's been looked at. As I mentioned to you before, niacin failed to show any event reductions, even though it lowered triglycerides. Fibrates failed to show any cardiovascular benefits, even though they lowered triglycerides and even traditional omega supplements that are available over the counter did not show event reductions. So that begged the question, how did icosapental ethyl suddenly reduce atherosclerotic events when all these other triglyceride changing therapies did not? Well, we still don't have a full understanding of it, but we are starting to better understand this molecule. And one of the things that we have seen from imaging studies that have been done is that you know, the addition of icosapental ethyl on top of statin therapy appears to result in coronary plaque regression. This was lo looked at in the evaporate trial. This was a coronary, uh, calcium, a, a coronary CTA trial. Um, so CTA was done in all of these patients. They had maximum background statin therapy and then were randomized to icosapental ethyl versus placebo. And what we saw is that there was a significant attenuation in the progression of atherosclerotic disease as measured by CTA and a significant number of patients actually saw a regression of atherosclerotic disease. So the plaque seemed to regress. And when we looked at that in particular in, in closer detail, what we actually saw, and this is an example of one of those patients, is that the biggest reduction is in the vulnerable a segment of that plaque. So the, the part of the plaque that leads to plaque rupture and to, leads to acute MIs or stroke or gangrene is that, that, that the cholesterol rich component, the necrotic core. And what we saw is that the addition of icosapental ethyl after 18 months, when we re-imaged this at particular individual, for example, we saw a dramatic reduction in that necrotic core. So the, the overall lumen seemed to, seemed to improve slightly in size, but the necrotic core that can actually rupture, uh, lead to plaque rupture and lead to uh, an MI or stroke or, or gangrene, that was substantially reduced within 18 months by the addition of icosapental ethyl. So it appears to be that the major event reductions that we saw with the addition of icosapental ethyl 
to background statin therapy comes from the changes it's making to the actual plaque itself, particularly to that necrotic core that can lead to plaque events, MI strokes or, or leg gangrene. So to conclude, we know that patients with background statin therapy continue to be at risk for cardiovascular events despite our best efforts to get them onto statin therapy. That risk happens from a number of reasons, including the impacts of triglycerides, but other impacts like diabetes, hypertension, lipoprotein A that we've talked about, endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, all of those contribute to that risk. We now suddenly have a number of therapies that have become available to us beyond statins, aspirin and ACE inhibitors, certainly azitamide, we've talked about PCSK9 inhibitors, we've talked about Vesepa that we've just talked about all show significant reductions in events, SGLT2 inhibitors in diabetics, GLP-1 agonists, vascular dose Zoralto, the 2.5 BID dose that's been looked at in the COMPASS study, all showing further benefits in certain patient populations. And certainly as somebody who firmly believes in cardiac rehabilitation and runs, runs our regional cardiac rehab program, we cannot forget the impacts of lifestyle interventions like cardiac rehabilitation, smoking cessation. So the question really comes down to, we have so many choices now beyond aspirin, statins, uh, and uh, ACE inhibitors for our vascular patients. Who do we need to add what to? And that becomes challenging at times. That led us at Cambridge Cardiac Care Center to develop a risk management tool and guide that's now available on our website. I'll plug that very briefly. It is a guide that we've developed for all of our colleagues in primary care and secondary uh, care to try to, to help identify those patients that will benefit more. I'll just show you very briefly how it works. I'm ho hoping that this launches properly. Are you able to uh, see the, uh, the, uh, the risk guide? No, Dr. Pandey, you'll need to stop sharing and then share your screen. Okay, I'm just, just going to, yeah. yep, I'm going to stop sharing and then, um, I'm going to try to go back to share if I can figure out how to do that. Um, I will share screen again and so this uh, I'm hoping you can see our um, Perfect. Our Perfect. risk tool. So this is a tool on our website to help identify individuals that will benefit from further risk reduction strategies. It's called the Reach Risk Calculator. Um, and it's a very simple tool that's available on our website. Um, easy to help identify individuals that remain at increased residual risk. You just literally plug in some patient demographics. So I'll just work through someone with you. Say it's a male, say he's between the ages of 65 to 69. He's a smoker. He's a diabetic. He's of normal weight. And say he has two, two disease, uh, two, two sites of vasosclerosis. He has coronary disease and peripheral vascular disease. He has not had a cardiovascular event in the year, in the last year. He doesn't have heart failure. He doesn't have atrial fibrillation. He is on maximum statin therapy. He is on aspirin and he is of North American, Western European descent. So this calculator will help calculate this patient's individual risk. And so it tells us that this person's risk of having an acute cardiac event in the next 20 months is 8.5%, whereas if we optimized his risk, we could reduce that risk all the way down to 3.8%. So telling us what that residual risk is that we can modify, his risk of dying of a cardiovascular event in those 20 months is 4%, whereas with optimum therapy, we can reduce that risk down to 1.4%. So telling us that there is significant things that we can do. And our hope is that this can help motivate our patients to adopt other therapies that can help to reduce their risk. So not only does the risk tool help to, to identify identify these patients, but our goal is to then give guidance as to what we should do next. And so it automatically opens up certain strategies that may fit for this population. So for this patient, for example, he's a, a smoker and there are ran randomized trials, for example, with certain smoking cessation strategies that have been shown to reduce cardiovascular events. And so those are outlined in the smoking cessation a tool that opens up to suggest that he may benefit from it. 
because he's not had an event in the last year, he doesn't necessarily qualify for cardiac rehabilitation, but certainly lifestyle optimization we would continue to emphasize. He is on background uh, statin therapy. He may not be a target, and there are further options that we outline with the addition of either azetamibe or PCSK9 inhibitor. If his triglycerides were elevated, then icosapentyl ethyl would pop up, suggesting that if their triglycerides are above 1.5, we should be considering the addition of, of icosapentyl ethyl or vasipa on top of that. Because he's a diabetic, we recommend the addition of SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 agonists. And in this case, because he has polyvascular disease, again, it gives us what the data is on the addition of rivaroxaban low-dose rivaroxaban or vascular dose rivaroxaban 2.5 BID on top of statin therapy. Uh, the tool then, if you want the citations from it, which what papers actually outline that, you can open up the citation box. I can show you what the, the papers were that outline that. And we also created a print tool so that you can hit the print button. It will print that as either a PDF or a JPEG that can then uh, be easily inserted into the patient's EMR. We're about to add in a, a tool on the, the, uh, the website at the suggestion of uh, one of our colleagues that we be able to email directly from this page. So you know, now that we're doing a lot of virtual care, uh, if we wanted to email this to our patients so they could see their residual risk and see what they could benefit from the addition of other therapies, lifestyle interventions, it can help perhaps to motivate those patients and help guide uh, further add-on therapies or additional therapies that could help to, to reduce and mitigate risk as we go along. So I'm going to finish up and hopefully uh, open up to some, some questions uh, as we go through um, the end of uh, my presentation. Um, the goal of this is really to help identify individuals that remain at increased uh, at risk of cardiovascular events despite our maximum therapy. And uh, certainly not every patient needs everything, but there are certainly some patients that will benefit from the addition of newer novel therapies and intervention strategies that can help to, to further mitigate their risk and reduce the risk of uh, cardiovascular events in this patient population, specifically in certain patients, the addition of azetamide, perhaps PCSK9 inhibitors, those that have significantly elevated uh, LDLs despite maximum step therapy, and the addition of, of icosapentyl ethyl, specifically in those that have elevated marginally elevated triglycerides just above 1.5 in those that uh, uh, are either diabetic or have established cardiovascular disease. Um, so at this point, I'm going to stop talking and open it up to any uh, questions that may come up uh, and happy to uh, feel those questions and looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Pandy, for an excellent job and a very comprehensive presentation. I'll try, I'll try to summarize the key point that you addressed. So you, we, we have uh, seen tonight the 2029 new uh, dyslipidemia guidelines, and you kindly, uh, you know, classify them into what's not new, what we know already, and that's what's new, mainly the lipoprotein A measurements. Now it's it's uh, one of the key things that we should do, the coronary artery calcium scoring, and the hypertension disorders with pregnancy and you kindly uh, identified the statin indications, the PCSK9 inhibitors indications, and you also demonstrated the role of triglyceride reduction in uh, reducing the cardiovascular risks, and hence the new medication, the novel medication, Vasipa from the IPE, and it's their indication and the studies uh, demonstrating their benefit, whether reduce it or evaporate. Uh, there are maybe a couple of questions in the chat box. If a patient has allergy to fish or, uh, or shellfish, can they take uh, Vasipa? No, unfortunately, it, it is derived from a fish oil source. So if they have a true fish oil allergy, uh, they, should not be, uh, they should not be on Vasipa. Okay, there is another question, Dr. Pandy, regarding the uh, risk score. Uh, there is a question regarding if you use the cardiometaboli cage.com risk score. Um, I don't personally use it. It's, it's, it's a very reasonable 
scoring system to use. Uh, the Canadian guidelines uh, for primary prevention continue to suggest that we use the modified Framingham risk score. We've done further modifications to it in the, the current iteration of the guidelines. Uh, remember, the traditional Framingham risk score does not incorporate family history, ethnicity, or novel risk markers like lipoprotein A. So we have adopted those in the new guidelines, modifying the Framingham risk score, but the cardiometabolic age score is, is a reasonable alternative to look at. Um, I personally don't use it. Okay, there is a little bit of a long question, but I believe if you can highlight a little bit or explain a little bit the coronary R3 calcium score. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, historically, we did not recommend coronary, coronary calcium scoring. Um, for various reasons. One, there was not enough data to suggest that we could use it effectively to stratify patients and make clinical decisions in a meaningful manner. As well, historically, the amount of radiation that, that CT scoring required used to be quite high. Um, now, fortunately, that the CT scanners are such high resolution and such fast scanners, the amount of radiation that's required for coronary artery, artery calcium scoring specifically is marginal. And we now have uh, evidence that, that using that as a risk modifier can help identify patients that, that are at risk, but we have not identified their risk yet. So the, the patient population to really look at that in is those that are at a moderate risk for uh, cardiovascular events by traditional risk scores, where we're just not sure, should we put them on a statin or not? And this helps to tip that balance. Uh, if you've already decided, as I said, that they should be on statin therapy, then there's no benefit from the addition of calcium scoring. Um, it's, it is a bit of a challenge to access at this point. Um, certainly in the middle of COVID, it's been a huge challenge. Uh, most imaging uh, you know, has, been, has been limited for, for prevention screening. But even otherwise, uh, you know, regionally, calcium scoring has been a little bit of a challenge. St. Mary's does do it. Um, right now, actually, the shortest waiting times to get calcium scoring is actually in Guelph at Guelph General. Um, but the, um, the thing that will also change, though, is that our perfusion scans, so the MIBI scans that, that we've all traditionally ordered, for example, for ischemia testing, um, both in Cambridge and some of the other facilities, Cambridge Memorial and other facilities, we will be changing our, our, uh, our MIBI scanners to be SPECT CT scanners that will actually allow us to get calcium scoring at the same time. So we will both be able to look at perfusion as well as look at the amount of calcium inside the coronaries and give a calcium score at the same time. So that will improve our, our availability of this diagnostic tool uh, to a broader sub-segment uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. Right now, access to them is still a little bit um, difficult to, to get to. Uh, certainly in GTA, it's much more readily available. I think the other part of it was that if they have a low triglyceride, but a high calcium score, would we still consider adding in IPE? Um, there's no data on this at this point. You know, they, If their triglycerides are truly below 1.5, um, then, you know, they wouldn't fit into the reduce it trial. Um, I'm not sure if there's a trial specifically planned to look at that. That's actually a very interesting question. Um, I'm not sure if that trial has ever been thought of yet, but at this point, uh, I'm not aware of any data uh, in those with uh, truly low triglycerides with the addition of IPE. Uh, but remember, when we're talking about elevated triglycerides, we're only talking about 1.5, which is actually in the traditional normal range of triglycerides. We've traditionally historically thought of elevated triglycerides above 2.5, 2.7, above 3. Uh, 1.5 is often felt to be within the normal range. It's in an, only a minimal elevation, uh, and we saw a robust reduction in that setting. Okay, Dr. Pendy, uh, now regarding the, uh, the patient, who is the right patient for a family doctor to try to prescribe IPE vasib? So I think, you know, um, the, the, there's, there's a large sub, a sub segment of patients that, that family practice, I think, uh, can have a very important impact on. Um, certainly, you know, the, a large part of the, the reduced trial was primary prevention diabetics that had slightly elevated triglycerides. So if your diabetic is on statin therapy and their, their triglycerides are above 1.5, we saw that the addition of IPE or VASIPA significantly reduced cardiovascular events very quickly within, within a year. Um, so certainly that's a primary prevention population where there is robust benefits. Uh, 
But similarly, in those patients that have established atherosclerotic disease, if they're no longer being followed by cardiology or a vascular specialist, um, certainly, you know, a lot of those patients are now back to primary care for their ongoing long-term care. If when you're doing their lipid management and they're already on maximum statin therapy and their LDL is adequately controlled, but their triglycerides are above 1.5, I would suggest that that's a patient that we should be considering the addition of uh, IPE. You know, when they saw their cardiologist or their vascular specialist, IPE may not have been available at that time and they may not have been recommended. So it does, I think, come down to, to primary care, making sure that patients remain current with the evidence. And the best evidence suggests that those patients that are on maximum statin therapy, if their triglycerides are above 1.5, will further derive benefits from the addition of IPE. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about suggesting IPE or Vasita to a high-risk patient uh, who is already taking an over-the-counter omega-3 uh, yeah. fatty acid? Uh, so one, I would, yeah, so it's a very good question. I would, first of all, tell them to stop taking their omega supplements. It's, uh, you know, as a country, we waste a lot of money on uh, unnecessary supplementation. Um, and, you know, there's there's been very large trials that have shown absolutely no benefit. Two massive trials that 130,000 patients in them showed absolutely no benefits from over-the-counter omega supplementation. So I think patients are wasting a lot of money. Um, if they continue to take it, you know, there's no interaction or harm from taking the omega supplement with the IPE. They're just wasting money on their omega supplement. So I would suggest they stop their, their omega supplement, but it would not preclude me from adding in IPE uh, if they still insisted that they wanted to take their natural over-the-counter omega supplement. Okay. Now that we have several agents uh, like uh, IPE, azitamibe, and the PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, which one to start with and how would be the priority between the three agents in case yeah. of high triglycerides? Yeah, and that's the, the, that's, that's, that's the complexity of it. There's so many therapies that have suddenly become available for us for ASCVD. That's where that REACH calculator that I showed you on our website, it, it does individualize it. It will tell you specifically in this population that you know a specific therapy may be of greater benefit than another. I'm hoping that that will help to, to make it easier to make that decision. Um, but you know, I think it comes down to, to uh, you know, what the guidelines would suggest. You know, our first target remains LDL. If their LDL is above 1.8, so that's that threshold. Um, if their LDL is above 1.8, we need to intensify LDL lowering therapies, and that would be azitamibe if their LDL is only modestly elevated, if it's between 1.8 to 2.2. If it's significantly above that, if it's above 2.2, then azitamibe is not going to get these patients to target, and we need to add in a PCSK9 inhibitor. So that's how I would think about the LDL arm of it. But there are some patients that will require both. So they will require both LDL reduction with either azitamibe and, or PCSK9 inhibitor uh, on top of statin, but their triglycerides are also elevated above 1.5 and they will further derive benefits from the addition of IPE. So they're not mutually exclusive strategies, um, but you know it does get complicated. And that was partly why we created that risk calculator that I showed you on our website. And it literally tells you for that specific individual patient, what would be the most bang for your buck to get started first. And again, you know, we should not lose sight of the impact of lifestyle intervention and smoking cessation and diet and exercise, which we again, continue to emphasize as the cornerstone of our risk reduction strategies. If we are prescribing a, uh, a Vasipa to a patient, uh, are there any tips or things that you are following up or looking for as a follow up with that patient on long-term? No, it's incredibly clean medication. You know, it, it does come from a natural source. It is a fish oil. We've purified it to 100% EPA. We've put, encapsulated it so it does not oxidize. And that's the reason it's so much more beneficial and more effective than over-the-counter fish oils because it's so purified and protected with that encapsulation. But it comes from a very natural source. Uh, and so the, the side effect profile is incredibly clean. The, the, the two things to be just cautious about about is if they're on anticoagulants and have a very high bleeding risk, um, you know, be cautious about that because all omega supplements have mild uh, blood thinning properties. Um, and, you know, in patients that that have uh, you know, uh, atrial fibrillation, you might see a slight increase 
in the incidence of atrial fibrillation, that does not preclude me from using it in that population uh, because, again, the actual cardiovascular benefits still accrue by the addition of EPA, but they may start reporting a bit more in the way of palpitations and things, so we may need to do some dose adjustments around that to control that. Um, so those are the only two things that, that, that to, to be cautious about. There's no, as I showed you in the renal data, you know, it, it has data across the full spectrum of renal uh, issues, so there's no concerns around that and has very robust data in diabetics as well. So we, we have a broad spectrum of patients at risk that can potentially benefit from this novel therapy. Okay. For a patient that we make a decision to start the PCSK9 inhibitors and the patient is already on a statin and is it rule? Should we stop the is it rule? I believe there is no rule for it. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so there's two answers to it. Um, no, don't stop it, mostly because they'll lose coverage for their PCSK9 inhibitor. So both ODB as well as the third party coverage uh, require the patient to be on statin and azitamide to, to cover the PCSK9, which is just ridiculous, but that's what the, 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 they are. So I wouldn't want them to suddenly lose coverage for, for their PCSK9 inhibitor. Uh, but the flip side is, you know, the you know, if you get a very low LDL, should you should you actually back off? And no, you you we don't back off. So we did subgroup analysis from the the cardiovascular outcome trials, Fourier and Odyssey outcomes, and what we saw is that the lower we drove the LDL the greater the event reduction. There was no bottom. So we had patients in, in the Fourier trial, for example, that their LDL was below 0.2. It was practically undetectable. And they had by far the lowest event rates. They, their coronary event rates were incredibly low. And we did a very detailed neurocognitive testing on it because that was one of the questions is, are you gonna cause memory changes and all these types of things? We were part of a study called Ebbinghaus, which did incredibly detailed. Every two weeks, we were bringing these patients back to do neurocognitive testing to see, was there any change in their neurocognition? And there was absolutely no change in neurocognition uh, by, uh, by very low LDLs that are, can be achieved with PCSK9 inhibitors. Similarly, you know, coming to the Vasipa question, we've looked at its impacts. There's no incidence, increase in incidence of diabetes, nor neurocognitive changes by the addition of Vasipa. So these new add-on therapies seem to be incredibly effective and very clean. And once we start them, you know, unless they're having side effects or some sort of specific problem to one of the therapies, uh, there's really no role to reduce therapy. And the more aggressive we are, uh, the the lower the event rates we will see. Okay, regarding the uh, triglyceride, uh, would you suggest testing them fasting or non-fasting? Does it make a difference? Yeah, so historically we've suggested that, that uh, you know, lipids be checked uh, uh, fasting primarily because it does impact triglycerides, but only modestly. Um, so, you know, the new guidelines actually suggest that, that because we can use other, uh, you know, things like uh, ApoB or non-HDL to determine their overall atherosclerotic risk, that we don't have to have our patients fasting and when we do it. I personally still send my patients fasting when I do it because I do want to get a true triglyceride level. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, both are equally yeah, reasonable yeah. strategies and the guidelines actually suggest that there's no firm requirement anymore for them to go in fasting. Okay. Now, uh, we discussed the type of patient that the family doctor can prescribe or start a patient on with the IPEA. Now, is there are a different type of patient or different indication that specialists, for instance, would prescribe IPE for? Yeah, so certainly, you know, I think uh, we all need to, to adopt these strategies aggressively, both in primary, uh, you know, care as well as in specialty care. I think the adoption is has not been as robust, primarily because a lot of this data came out in the middle of our pandemic, and and uh, you know, we got so caught up with the pandemic-related therapies. It's time now that we get past this pandemic, and we need to refocus our strategies on risk reduction. So I think there's a lot of work for all of us to do. There's a lot of patients that can potentially benefit from these newer therapies. And that's the reason why the CCS guidelines have just come out now. Um, we delayed bringing them out. Actually, they were ready for, for launch almost a, a, you know, almost a year ago. 
but we were all so in the midst of the crisis of the pandemic that there was a decision made to hold off on such a significant change in our recommendations till we were at a point where all of us could now start rethinking long-term prevention strategies. So I think all of us uh, need to be on board, but it's the same patient population. You know, I will be prescribing my diabetics that have elevated triglycerides modestly elevated, just above 1.5 uh, onto to Vesipa. Similarly, if their LDL is you know above 1.8 and they have astrocytic disease, I will be considering a zidomib or a PCSK9 inhibitor. So I think the, the data applies to both uh, specialist care as well as primary care. Okay. How about the post-PCI and cabbage uh, patients? So, you know, I showed you the, that revascularization as, uh, a uh, sub-study of, of uh, Vasipa from Reduce It. And what we showed is that, you know, when uh, the IPE uh, was added to patients, um, either, you know, for uh, PCI or uh, bypass, we delayed uh, the need for either form of revascularization substantially. And in a significant proportion of patients, we actually ended up avoiding revascularization altogether. So it has, you know, significant anti-atherosclerotic benefits. It seems to stabilize that plaque in a manner and starts potentially regression of plaque in some patients and can reduce the need for revascularization. So in both patient populations, there is a significant benefit from these new add-on therapies. Okay, how often do you suggest uh, checking patients' uh, lipid profile? So, um, you know, certainly we talked about lipoprotein A now being checked once in a lifetime. I've you now put it on my initial screening for all our patients, and we just record it into our EMR alert so I know what their background lipoprotein A is, and then I don't need to go back to check it again. In terms of, um, you know, the, the routine cholesterols, you know, I think it comes down to the risk profile and what they're on. Certainly, you know, the, the guidelines have very specific recommendations based on uh, their risk profile. All uh, adults should be having, you know, their cholesterol screened at 40 if they uh, come from a vulnerable population like the native Canadian population or South Asian populations at a younger age, perhaps at the age of 30, um, but cer and certainly diabetics should be screened at the onset of or the diagnosis of diabetes. So, you know, I think it really depends on the patient population as to when we start the screening. Um, and then, you know, depending on what therapy we've already initiated, you know, may also dictate how often we check it. So, you know, um, some of that comes down to continued coverage so again, you know, just like you were asking about, do we continue azitamide? Similarly, you know, if they're already on a statin, they're already on azitamide, they're already on a PCSK9 inhibitor, may already be on, on IPE, do I still need to continue to check their cholesterol? Well, we've done everything we can. Is there anything still to be done? Probably not. But the issue is that they'll start losing coverage uh, because these insurance companies want to see their number. So, you know, it's, sometimes we're doing these measurements, not necessarily for clinical decision making, but because so our patients continue to get coverage and continue to be uh, receiving therapies that they need. Um, but certainly, you know, uh, the once we start statins, you know, the recommendation is that they should have another cholesterol measurement anywhere between three to six months later to determine the next step. Is the statin enough? If their LDL is below 1.8, their triglycerides are low, they're below 1.5, perfect. Then we can keep them on it, maybe check it once a year. If their LDL is above 1.8, that's that threshold that the guidelines are now suggesting we need to intensify therapy, consider adding in either a zidomib if it's minimally elevated or a PCSK9 inhibitor if it's significantly elevated, or if their triglycerides are above 1.5, consider adding an IPE in that patient population. So I think that's that decision-making to be done around three to six months after the initiation of statin therapy to decide next steps. Once you have them on optimum therapy, then I think probably annual measurements to make sure that, that things are working and don't require further intensification may be adequate. That's, that tends to be my approach in this patient population. Okay, how about HDL? Is there any risk if it's too high or the higher the better? Yeah, so HDL is one of those things which, you know, a few years back, myself included, we all really had a lot of hope that HDL would be, you know, the, the miracle that if we could raise HDL, we could melt plaque away. And it turned out to be complete nonsense. Raising HDL through any mechanism has failed to show any benefits. Um, so what we used to think of as good cholesterol is at best bystander cholesterol. It's neutral cholesterol. It neither raises risk nor 
you reduce this risk and therapies like niacin or, you know, there was dalsetropib, which was a chemical agent that raised HDL by as much as 80%, completely failed to show any benefits in atherosclerotic event reduction. So, you know, uh, the enthusiasm around HDL has really completely disappeared. Um, at best, we can say it's a neutral cholesterol. It really doesn't come into decision making at all now. So no need to treat at all? No need to even think about it. I don't even look at the HDL number. Okay. Currently, the LDL target for diabetics is less than two. Should it change or would it change soon to one? Yeah, point? excellent question. Um, there is a very large trial that we're waiting to, to finish, which is a PCSK9 trial in diabetics um, without established cardiovascular disease. That trial we're expecting to, to get results within the next year. If that turns out to be a positive trial, then diabetics will fall into the same as ASCVD patients where we will use that 1.8 threshold. Right now, because we don't have that data, we're still keeping their, tri their target at two. Okay, now with all those new uh, agents in the market and all the options that we have, is there any role for Lodalis? So, you know, bile acid sequestrants uh, are effective at, at LDL reduction, but modestly they reduce it about 15 to 20%. There is actually a trial that shows that it, it can be added to even azidamide, because uh, azidamide, remember, also reduces cholesterol through the gut pathway, but it's at a different level. It's lowering it at the, the brush border, whereas bile acid sequestrants are literally binding bile. Um, so they work through different pathways. You know, the addition of bile acid sequestrants to azidamide uh, lowers LDL by an additional 10 to 12%. So there is some benefits. They come with a lot of side effects, GI side effects. Um, you know, to me, you know, it's one of those things that I turn to when I'm literally running out of things that I can do. I've already got them on maximum statin. I've got them on acetamide. I've tried to get them onto a PCSK9 inhibitor. Either I can't get coverage for them or they're intolerant to it or it doesn't get them to where I want. Then as a Hail Mary, I'll add in a, 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 a bile acid sequestrant. There is no randomized control trial data of, uh, of Lodalis or Colvesalam uh, to show its benefits on top of statin therapy. Um, the, the bile acid trials were from the 1970s and early 80s when statins were not around. And when they're on nothing else, bile acid sequestrants do reduce atherosclerotic events. Do they still reduce it? in the setting of all of these much more effective therapies, we don't know. So I tend not to use it very often, only in those where it's literally a Hail Mary pass where I've run out of things I can do for their LDL and they're still not a target. Okay, uh, maybe a couple of questions and we'll stop. We really exhausted uh, you and thank you for very much for taking all those questions. Uh, any you know particular common side effects for Repasa? So, you know, it's a uh, repatha, remember, is a very unique molecule. It's a antibody that that binds to PCSK9 and does nothing else. And as we've all gotten to use the uh, use various antibody-based therapies, what we've all learned is that they're just so specific at what they do. Their off-target effect is almost nothing. So the, you know, uh, my experience with Repatha and what the clinical trial data would suggest is that the only side effect is local irritation because it is subcutaneous. The first few doses, when they're getting used to it, they may not be injecting properly. They can have local site reactions. Beyond that, the off-target effects are literally, literally placebo level. There's no uh, increase in myalgias. There's no increased rates of diabetes. There's no neurocognitive changes. So they're incredibly well tolerated molecules with no real off-target effects that have been identified. Um, uh, you know, we do need a bit of training for those patients just to be able to inject them. Now, the uh, these companies that make them do have support programs in place where they will send nurses in to train patients to do the, the subcutaneous injections. Our pharmacies are trained to train patients as well. So there are different ways that uh, that we can get our patients trained, but that's literally the, the only significant side effect is, is local uh, skin irritation when they, they start the subcutaneous injection. Okay, maybe one last question, but I'll give you a break, Dr. Pandy, and maybe I'll direct right. that question to our sponsors, and maybe Kareem can address that question. How about the coverage? How our patient can access Vasiba? Sure, I can take that. So uh, we do have a, a generous assistance program in Ontario. We're fortunate that uh, over 95% of private insurers are uh, covering Vasiba. 
Uh, currently, we're waiting to hear back from the government uh, regarding ODB. I believe that was a question in the chat. But with our assistance program, uh, it covers up to 88% of the cost of the of uh, VASIPA for those patients who have any form of private insurance. Um, patients just simply call a 1833 number to register and uh, a support person will get them registered and then they go to the pharmacy two hours later. Uh, so as a follow-up, uh, I can put, uh, I can send out uh, the 1833 number. It comes on a, a card that can be emailed to patients and, um, and yeah, and that's it. It's, it's quite actually simple to use. So uh, key thing is just remember have the patients call the 1833 number first and then go to the pharmacy two hours later if they have any form of private insurance and that way the patient will get the maximum financial benefit. Okay. Yeah, I'll just add to that, you know, uh, the, the fact that it can be sent electronically, uh, we've started using that, uh, the electronic form uh, very frequently. And that's, that's really you know, very easy, you know, as we've all had to do a lot of virtual care these, these days, you know, if I'm starting someone on Vesipa, when I'm, you know, faxing that prescription to the pharmacy, I email the patient, uh, uh, the, this 800 card, and literally, you know, as I get off the phone, I just say, call this number. The, the pharmacy will have it covered for you by the time you get to the pharmacy. And the, the, my experience with it has been very positive. By the time they drive to the pharmacy to pick it up, the, the, uh, the assistance program has already contacted the pharmacy and gotten coverage uh, sorted out for them. Uh, so it makes both our hassles as physicians much less. We're not getting all these callbacks from patients saying, oh, I couldn't get this covered, blah, blah, blah. And similarly from the patient, they're not having to, to run in circles. Uh, the assistance program seems to, to do all of that legwork. And certainly my experience with it has been very positive that patients, um, you know, by the time they literally reach the pharmacy to pick up their, their drug, they've already got it covered. Uh, and the assistance program has handled all of the legwork. So the kudos to, to, uh, to HLS for putting that together. That's been a, a godsend, particularly at a time of uh, having to do all this virtual care to be able to just send these things electronically and have things ready for patients. Okay, one Thanks more. Thanks for adding that, Dr. Sandy. Okay. Sorry, you were going to say, I, I interrupted you, uh, Dr. Vickery. No, I, I believe we I believe we exhausted all the question. I don't see any more questions in the chat box. So again, uh, one more time, Dr. Pandey, thank you very much for a great presentation and thank you for taking the time to answer all those uh, questions. And thank you all for joining us tonight and taking the time for that interesting topic tonight. And uh, I extend our thanks for Krem and uh, Manish from HLS for sponsoring our event tonight. Thank you very much and have a, a great night. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm hoping next time we meet in person and uh, I get to see you all in person, but thank you so much for coming. And I really enjoyed all of the conversation and, and the chat and, uh, and uh, the calculator. The one thing I would ask is if people get a chance, if they can test out or we're constantly trying to improve it and, and add in other features to it. So if you have some feedback, if you can send it back to me as to ways we can make that risk reduction management tool a little bit more uh, easier to use, we're adapting them. And one of the things that we're adding in very soon, as I mentioned, is that someone had suggested, can we just email the results to the patient directly from the website so that it, they, they know what they need to do? And uh, that's something that we're, we'll be adding to the website very shortly. So that will also help to, to make it a little bit easier for us as we do these virtual care visits. So let me know if there's other things that we can be doing to help make it easier as we to adopt these newer therapies. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And Krim, just to uh, to to just to me, uh, you will be sending uh, me the uh, the recording of the uh, tonight. Uh, uh, event with the slides, including Dr. Pandy's calculator, and I can pass it along to colleagues, correct? Yes, um, Manish, Manish has, um, he, yeah. he'll, he'll, Manish, are you still there?